the one book, the one book that set me on this path, the one book that gives me the background through which to defend myself and if I have to attack other people or groups. The one book I've read five or six times, okay, which carry in my back pocket on the way to the pub, all right, to keep reading and reading. This is the book that sets the stage for Western thinking. This is the one that fractures everything, that makes us understand. If you ever get a copy of this book, don't read it, learn it. It says in the title, The Hidden Agenda of Modernity. Well, there's a hidden agenda here. We have to expose that hidden agenda to see osteopathy more clearly because it's in our system. And if you don't recognise it, we don't know it's getting in the way all the time. So, if I could read that, in the 19th century, I can't read that at all. Anyway, it talks about the fact that the, the hidden agenda is the agenda of rationality, the agenda of order, the agenda of, of lineality. This is the danger, and this came about through the work of Isaac Newton. And that's what the books were about. It's about the whole movement of the 30 years war in Europe in the 17th century. Everything changed after that. Um, Jane was talking about pre-Civil War yesterday and post-Civil War. This had, all wars do that, especially the 30 years war in the 17th century. We went from this humanistic world approach to this rational approach. All wars change things. Uh, on that note, Perry Miller, the historian, is the key to the American mind. And he wrote about the American Civil War, which I'm just planning through this book at the moment. So, philosophy of science and the senses. This is where we actually, we do things. We, we treat people. We put our hands on people. We have to know how these senses work, why they work, what went wrong. Right? Um, again, I've had to cut this down because of time. Um, so let's, look at, let's have a quick look at Copernicus. We know about the Copernican Revolution. Um, this is where things changed in a major fashion. Galileo got himself in a spot of bother with the Italians. Never mind. Um, okay, Galileo, that which can't be mathematically, mathematicised is placed in the person. John Locke took this on later on for what we call now the primary and secondary qualities, which we don't use those terms anymore, but they're in the system. So Galileo's doing his stuff, okay, we see Galileo, so they're doing his stuff, and he's looking at the moon, he's looking at planets, coming to some ideas, lots of mathematics. Now, when we looked at his, when Henry Bortoff, when Henry Bortoff looked at his original notes, they found out, and I've been going through some stuff recently, that what Galileo wrote down, what actually happened, has made a major bearing on how we understand sense perception. When Galileo started looking at planets, it took him six to nine months to see anything. He was looking through a telescope, but he couldn't see anything. There was nothing wrong with the telescope. There was nothing wrong with his eyes. It was his meaning and perception. We are used now to Google Maps, looking at down at things. Where would you ever be in a position to look down from a height? So it isn't in your cult, it's not in your perception. This is what Galileo saw for months. You remember that time you first palpate that person for the first time? This is the visual version of your palpation. Listen, I can't feel a thing. How am I ever going to be an osteopath? I can't feel a thing. He couldn't see anything. He actually wrote this down. And this is significant. Because what it means is our senses are useless. Our senses are meaningless. This is what happens. It took months before he could actually see anything. It was a conceptual development, not a seeing. It's a conceptual development. If you, change that, if you change the conception, you see things differently. This is what I'm going to be working on. I'm going to change your conception. Um, as I said, Bortoff got in contact with the original works. These books are very valuable at Cambridge University. Now, this is where Gale went wrong, you see. He forgot this happened, this fuzziness. Of course, he's got to get to the church, hasn't he? Hang on a minute, guys. I think the Earth is not the centre of the solar system. I think the sun is. But he's got to prove it. So he, he has to go to the church. He's got a friend, he's got a mate high up, you see. So he makes the biggest error of his life. He takes, he shows them. He asks them to have a look. What do they see? You know, he gets himself locked up under house arrest. They don't see anything. 
And that was the problem. So you guys, me, trying to go to other professions and go, can't you feel what we're feeling? Ain't gonna happen. In fact, some of the early journals of the 1930s, 1940s in osteopathy, the American journals, recognized this. They couldn't get the medics to do it. And who's gonna hang around for eight months? <laughs> That's what the problem is, it's a conceptual problem. So, what we have to do with the medics is not make them feel with feeling, change their conceptual ideas. So, out of this disturbance, while you're being locked up for showing absolutely nothing through a telescope, he came to this conclusion, never trust the senses, the senses deceive. This is why we talk about empiricism and rationalism today, which I want to touch on again. We don't trust the senses anymore for the wrong reasons. The primary and secondary qualities, primary qualities are all those things that can be mathematicized, things you can quantify in number, in ratio, in one part to the next. This is, a, this is classical, this is classical in physics. Uh, secondary qualities, all things that are personal, sight, seeing, touch, taste, even color. Problem is, if I'm gonna measure something, I've got to see it first, haven't I? If I'm going to measure sound, I've got to hear it first, then measure it. This is why Western philosophy has got us in this mess. This is why we've got increasing amounts of mental health issues within in society, because my personal feelings are not marrying up with science, the way things should be. It's all back to front. Even our understanding of the human body is back to front. Um, this whole dissection process, seeing things in motion, things are catching up again. We take the soul out of something and we put it back in again. Aristotle knew this. We've got Dr. Van Hungu, whatever his name is, with the hat, with body works, doing the same thing. Stripped to the bone, doing this. It's the reanimation. Aristotle saw this happening. The anima. Now we have the animation. The deanimation of the human being, the removal of the soul, the spirit out. And, we, and then we recreate it again, thinking that we're in charge, because we can do this. So when I was asked to go and see body works, I said, body works? I've got problems with the living, the mother the dead. <laughs> we think these things are moving because they're doing this, because we, we're put into this animation process. And the anima in the English word is animation, which means to move, to move, to dance. So we've deanimated our patients, we've deanimated things, we've taken the soul out of it. So, <clears throat> it's probably some of these foundations. We've just touched on Cartesian ideas. Here he is, the father of modern science, the man that spent his, a large part of his um, modern uh, adult life in a room looking out of a window, distrusting what he's looking at, and thinking, all those people down there, they might actually not be people. They might be robots trying to deceive me. And then spend his time looking in a stove called Descartes' stove, which apparently they still have from the 17th century. So his thought processes are the foundation of modern thinking. Mm -hmm. So he was inspired by Galileo. He realized that Galileo hadn't done enough, as far as he was concerned. Um, and he knew that the sense-based conception had to be changed to a mathematical-based conception. Um, he proved the existence of God, Okay, here's how he did it. Now, laugh for a short time because then you suddenly realize we are in trouble. If we have a soul and, uh, or a mind and a body, all bodies can be weighed and measured. Yeah, sounds good enough, fine, right, anybody. Now body doesn't mean body, it means body. Anything physical that you can see, if it can be weighed, if it can be measured, that means it's real. Okay, well hang on that one. Therefore, he says, therefore, the mind, which is the soul, must also be real. Because if you assume body and mind, then you've got to go with it. Fine. Therefore, God exists. Okay, Descartes, that's fine. That's it. That was his argument. The Jesuits love this. The Jesuits, which then started up the whole university system, hence we have the word university. Uni means one. Versity means to move. It means prime mover god the whole university education system was based on this phenomenon the jesuits very clever they loved descartes 
The key to Descartes philosophy is the word substance, which was a misinterpretation of the words of the work from Aristotle. The word substance means see how important it is, it's a very important word. I feel almost students. So the top ten important words are substance. Substance, that which is separable from all else. This has stuck in Western philosophy. We seek, and this is how our language has developed. I, you, here, there. This is how our language developed since the 17th century. Descartes aim, a mathematical physics consistent with the church. We still, this is why we do mathematics. We have to do mathematics because it keeps God in existence. Those people who use mathematics are doing the same dance. The music might be different, but the dance is still the same. If you use mathematics, you are supporting the existence of God. I don't have an argument with that, but no problem with that, as long as we know what we're doing. And this leads to a dualism, the immortal soul and the mortal body. Only a mind separate from the body can achieve knowledge. So we end up with this intellectual process. Sticking your hand on a patient and doing something is not intellectual as far as Western philosophy is concerned. That's why it's always seen as a second-hand medicine, the weaker medicine. In fact, it's not. It's the opposite. And this is what we were saying in the reference earlier on about the Cartesian not being verifiable and the Goethean being both verifiable and...